ready to take on the world's greatest museum. And I'm ready to show it to you because I've got my badge. So it's okay, like I told you, to walk you around. This includes that I can speak to you as well, too. Because I'm president of the Hawaii Geographic Society and they recognize me here now. So I can talk without us getting kicked out. <laughs> So, stick close to me. We're going to go through security first, and then we'll go to the ticket booth area, and then we'll go in the museum. And let's walk along and get down to the slaves. This is a, a very passionate piece by Michelangelo. Look at the emotion in the face there. So, the blocks of stone that we saw lining the halls of the academia that were just partly finished, would have all looked like this in the end, each one slightly different pose, of course. But this was all part of that same series that was going to be the tomb for Pope Julius II that never got built. The only thing that's really left in Rome of that tomb is the statue of Moses in a church. But we have various pieces, and particularly two of them, this one and also this one over here by the great master himself. This is the newly renovated Grand Gallery it's been closed for oh, most of the last two years in one way or another, but now it's fully reopened and it's returned to its prime glory as the longest hall of art anywhere in the world, the Grand Gallery. And it has many, many important paintings and many minor paintings that we're just gonna skip over. So if you come along with me, I'll just point out some of the more interesting pieces. This is probably the, the finest Raphael perhaps ever done. It's certainly the finest Raphael that's in the Louvre. The Virgin and Child with John the Baptist. And it's just perfect, just standing in its own right. And you see this classical triangular format of the subject matter with the vast background receding behind. Very similar to Leonardo's works as well. They were contemporaries. Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo. And it's just a perfectly sweet composition and your eye can just move around it from eye, from face to face to face. And you just never get tired of looking at it. You have this beautiful soft modeling of the skin. It's like they're alive, like they're standing there in a little window box. But we do have a couple of beautiful landscapes by Anibale Karachi and they're said to be two of the finest landscapes in the Louvre. And in some ways, they almost foreshadow Impressionism. That he's breaking away here from the earlier themes of the religion or the portraits of wealthy people or just architectural paintings and getting into this feeling for the, the rural. A Caravaggio, very famous Caravaggio painting here, the fortune teller. And you see some of the hallmarks of Caravaggio style, which are the, this three-dimensional feeling. The sword hilt is coming out of the picture plane at us. The hands are really uh, separated out from, from the bodies. There's a lot of space involved here. There's a background, and you have this dramatic lighting coming in from the side as well. So you have a lot of uh, light and dark characteristics that create the three-dimensionality. Caravaggio pioneered this, and then many others after him copied it. We started our tour really with Ghirlandaio in Florence. Well, here we have some oil paintings by the master. What a nose on that guy, huh? <laughs> and just beautiful, again, very early Renaissance. This is right around the time, just after Masaccio, when perspective had just been rediscovered. So he was uh, one of the teachers of Michelangelo. Michelangelo <coughs> mixed, mixed paint in his workshop. And this is by Veronese. He's an Italian. This whole room is Italian artists, Italian Renaissance, and it's called the Wedding Feast at Cana. So it's the miracle of turning the water to wine. You see in the lower right part of the painting there. And really, Veronese used the wedding feast as, as a, a pretext, as a framing to portray the people of Venice at the peak of the La Serenissima back in the 17th century when Venice was at its most grand and most powerful. So these are a lot of real people, including Veronese in the middle, playing the viola. Self-portrait by the artist. You're all waiting to see the most famous painting in the world. Let me just tell you a minute about it first, and then you go head on in there and take some pictures. La Mona Lisa by Leonardo. 
La Gioconda, and it is the certainly the most famous painting in the world, and not necessarily the best, but it's certainly a great masterpiece. It was the first painting of the Louvre. Francis I had Leonardo come to Paris, and Leonardo was still working on this painting. For 20 years, he worked on this painting. And he kept this painting with him in his bedroom, under his bed. He wouldn't let anybody else get close to it. But finally, he did give it to the king as a present. And that's what started the Louvre collection. <laughs> so you'll enjoy her mysterious smile and the wonderful background of the painting. I told you, he only finished about 15 paintings in his career. In the Louvre, there's four of them. We'll see three more outside. One, two, three, four paintings by the greatest master. And the Virgin of the Rocks is just one of his finest. When we get to London in a few days, I'll take you in the National Gallery and show you. They have another version of this. It's a little cleaner and brighter. But here, too, we can see the beauty of Leonardo's work, the ringlets of hair, the soft lighting, the sfumato, it's called, the light and dark, and this mysterious background, something like that in the Mona Lisa, the Virgin of the Rocks. Have a good look at that crucifixion scene by Montaigne. You'll see incredible detail even in the vast distant background. He's one of the most important painters of all and also uh, Montaigne Saint Sebastian. So have a close up look at those two please. What a painting. What is going on here? This is painted by Delacroix and what we have is this uh, royal Turk on the bed there surveying the scene of carnage. Look at what's going on. Death and destruction. The legend that goes with this is that he, he's a very wealthy Turkish ruler. He decided to end it all. So he was going to go out with a blast. So he gathered together all of the things that he held most precious, all of his friends and lovers and wealth, and had them all killed. And then he committed suicide. Pretty gruesome tale but a fabulous painting nonetheless. Delacroix, he, uh, he enjoyed this kind of gruesome scene. We're gonna work our way over to the Raft of Medusa in a moment, which is a similar kind of nightmarish scene. But first, let's look at liberty leading the people just over here. So here we have Delacroix. It's liberty leading the people, and you can see in the background the Church of Notre Dame, there's flames, the people are, have just died, the, the rebels, the heroes have died, and the young drummer boy even has picked up a gun to help lead on the charge. And liberty was really the symbol of France for the last um, 150 years. Her portrait is on a lot of the French currency as well, and has been over the years. Next we'll go down to Jericho and the Raft of Medusa. The Raft of Medusa is based on an actual incident that happened. It was a terrible tragedy of a shipwreck um, back in the early 19th century. The ship went down off the coast of Africa and these people were tr are some of the survivors and yet you see on the raft also some of the dead people. There's only a few survivors. Most of the people in this painting are dead. And Jericho actually went to the morgues and studied the, uh, the victims of this event and made sketches and so it's a very realistic and vivid piece. The captain abandoned ship and he sped off in a lifeboat and he was okay and he left his crew to die and only a very few people survived. They were uh, cannibalizing each other. They're out on this raft for a very long time and you see the incredible pyramid shape. Uh, we have two pyramid shapes really here balancing out this tremendous storm. The raft is rocking and bouncing and waving and they're desperately trying to get to that ship. The result of the incident and this painting, this is sort of like uh, advocacy journalism that Jericho was doing, was a complete revamping of the maritime laws in France. And they changed all the laws and they made the conditions much safer as a result of the uproar that went with this painting.